Okay, good morning everybody. I'm happy to be here today to continue our school. I'm very happy that this school is taking place at the Mathematics Institute of the University of Campinas here in Brazil to receive these distinguished guests here with us. That's a privilege. Uh, what I'm going to talk today is like a continuation of what I told yesterday about Ampere's electrodynamics because Weber uh, he was a German physicist. He was heavily uh, influenced by the work of Ampere. His whole electrodynamics did originate from the work of Ampere. Uh, in the textbooks nowadays, we learn electrodynamics in a different paradigm, <laughs> which is based on the Maxwell's equations, the four Maxwell's equations, and the Lorentz force law. So the Maxwell's equations, they are based on the electric and magnetic field. And the same as regards Lorentz force law, electric and magnetic field. So this is a uh, paradigm which did originate with uh, Faraday and uh, Maxwell did go on with this approach. At the end, if we have time, I want to discuss with you the meaning of the velocity which appears in Lorentz force law. That's the velocity of the charge relative to what? But today, what I will discuss is another paradigm of electrodynamics, which is, was developed by this German physicist, Wilhelm Weber, his signature here. He was professor of of physics at Göttingen University. He did work with, in collaboration with Gauss. Gauss did suggest his name, he, they had met in Berlin in 1828, and Gauss suggested, and the university hired Weber in 1831. And only from 1831 that Weber did begin to work with electrodynamics. He was a contemporary of Maxwell. He was born before Maxwell and died after Maxwell. He had a longer life than Maxwell, but they did overlap their lives. Uh, Maxwell did quote a lot about Weber, and there are a few quotations of, of Weber about Maxwell's words. So, what was the approach of Weber? Weber also wanted to unify electrodynamics, just like Maxwell, but Weber didn't work with the field concept. Weber did follow another approach. He did follow the Newtonian approach, that we have Newton's law of gravitation, then Coulomb's law of charges, which is force, depends on the charge and the distance. Weber knew about Ampere's law, which I spoke yesterday, which is similar to Coulomb's law, I1, A2 over R squared. It is a central force, but it also depends on the angles of the two elements. For the time being, I will not discuss them here. But Weber also knew the Faraday's law of induction that an electromotive force is proportional to the time variation of the current. For instance, if I change the intensity of the current in the primary circuit, I induce a current in the secondary circuit. So Weber knew all of these, and he wanted to unify these three branches. So, how to unify? One approach was Maxwell, based on field, but Weber was a Newtonian. So his idea was, what is a current? No one knew at that time what a current was. So the idea of Weber was that current is charge in motion. If current is charge in motion, here we should have Q1 times velocity 1, Q2 times velocity 2. So so we have, should have here V1, V2, 
okay? Because current is charging motion. If current is charging motion, what is di by dt? That is acceleration. So the main idea of Weber was an hypothesis that current is charging motion and di by dt we should have acceleration. So that is his whole idea. It is a generalization of Coulomb's law introducing a component which depends on the product of the two velocities in order to obtain Ampere's law and a component which depends on acceleration so that he could, could deduce Faraday's law. So microscopically the idea of Weber is about Faraday's law. If you accelerate charge in the primary circuit, you induce a force in the secondary circuit. So the, the component of force should depend on the acceleration between the charges. So it's a very reasonable and simple approach. But there are, there are no fields here. So this is the essence of Weber's electrodynamics. In one slide, one equation. Okay? That is his equation. And with Weber, he didn't even have the vectors. Okay? Because, like Newton, the force is along the straight line connecting the two charges. So we have here Coulomb's law. We have here a component which depends on the relative acceleration between the two interacting charges. R2 dots is the relative acceleration between the two charges. I'm expressing Weber's law here in international system of units to facilitate in vector notation, which Weber didn't utilize. And with the modern uh, utilization of the constant C, which is like velocity. Weber had another constant C, which I want to <coughs> discuss it here. So at that time, 1846, Weber didn't know the value of this constant which connects Ampere's law of electrodynamics with Coulomb's law. Weber was the first to measure this constant together with Kohlhausch. And that was 10 years later, in 1856. And they found that this constant has essentially the light value of the light velocity in vacuum. That was before Maxwell. That was the first connection between electrodynamics and optics. And that was an experimental result of Weber. What I, are... I about the, the velocities. Yes. So, so R is the difference. R, R, R is, is the relative velocity between the two charges. But I thought they depend on the... On the that, that's and for ampere, for current elements. Weber is for point charges. So for point charge, there are no length of the current elements. So Weber's is a force for point charge, not for current elements. Okay? The, the, the other expression which I spoke yesterday is about current elements. They have a length and they, we have angles, but not for point charge. That's a good point. But the two point charges, they could move in, in arbitrary Yes, they can move in any directions. But, but, but the force for, by only Weber... The, the relative velocity. Yes, only the dr by dt, yes. I, I will come back to Ampere's laws. What are the main properties of Weber's force? When there are no relative motions, we return to the law of Coulomb and then to the law of Gauss, the first of Maxwell's equations. It follows action and reaction. Therefore, we have conservation of linear momentum. Moreover, the force is along the straight line connecting the two charges. So we have also conservation of angular momentum. Two years later, Weber showed that he could deduce his force law from this velocity dependent, dependent potential energy. So that his potential depends also on velocity. This was the first time in the history of physics that someone introduced a velocity dependent potential energy so that the kinetic plus potential energy that is a constant in time so we have conservation of linear momentum angular momentum and energy 
Moreover, uh, Weber succeeded in deducing Faraday's law of induction. I won't go into the details here. Who wishes to see the detail? You can read Maxwell himself. The last chapter of Maxwell's treatise is devoted to Weber's electrodynamics. And Maxwell shows there that with Weber, you deduce Faraday's law and Ampere circuital law with Weber. Maxwell shows that. I won't go into the details here. So the Maxwell's equations can be deduced by Weber's electrodynamics. Maxwell acknowledged that. But what made me, Andre, work with this force law is another thing, which I call relational. It depends only on the distance between the two charts, relative velocity, and relative acceleration. Only between the interacting charts, the observer does not appear here. Only the distance between the two charts, relative velocity between the interacting charts, and relative acceleration, dr by dt, and second derivative of the distance. This is what they call relational, to avoid confusion with Einstein's uh, series of relativity. I will, uh, you can give a look on a book on Weber's electrodynamics, which is we published some years ago. It has in English and Portuguese. So you can give a look at the end, please. We turn them here. What I'm discussing today is available in these two books. So to me, this was what made me work, begin to work with Weber 30 years ago. So this, this is, is the... Sorry? Say it again, please. Even if the observer is accelerating. Yes, the, the observer do, doesn't matter. The observer doesn't matter at all. L like in Newton's law of gravitation, the only thing which matters if you are studying the motion of a satellite of Jupiter, Io, for instance, it doesn't matter the distance of you, of the satellite to you, only the distance of the satellite to, to the center of Jupiter, the R. So, if one day we discover that the law of gravitation should depend on velocity and acceleration, to me it should depend on the velocity between the satellite of Jupiter and Jupiter, between the acceleration between the satellite of Jupiter and Jupiter, not uh, relative to myself, because it's not interacting with me. The satellite is interacting with Jupiter. So, that makes sense to me, Weber. So, these books, you can give a look at the talk today is based on this book. Okay. So, as I said, with Weber, when we begin with Weber, we deduce Ampere's law. Obviously, the history was the opposite. Weber knew this law and created his electrodynamics to deduce this law. With Lorentz's force law, on the other hand, as I said, uh, uh, you deduce only this Grassmann's force law. You can't deduce Ampere's law with slow rents. And you can't deduce this Grassmann's law with Weber. So if one day we can distinguish these two experimentally, that would help to distinguish Weber and Lorentz. Okay? But I won't go into the details how to deduce that with Weber, but you can give a look at that later on. But here we have the angles, not with Weber. Weber is a central force. Now, I will talk a, a, about the most fascinating result deduced by Weber and Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff was not a direct student of Weber, but very uh, strongly connected with Weber. Both of them, they did uh, Weber and Gauss, they did build the first working telegraph in the world. There is a plaque at the stern part in Göttingen uh, about this discovery. And there is the main statue of Weber and Gauss at the central park in Göttingen is about the, the electric telegraph which they did uh, create. The first one connected the physics institute where Weber worked with the observatory where Gauss worked. So they 
due to an operational telegraph, 1833, if I'm not mistaken. 20 years later, Weber and Kirchhoff were the first to deduce the telegraphy equation, the complete telegraphy equation. Kelvin Thompson was working on this subject in England, but he did obtain the equation for the propagation of heat. Weber and Kirchhoff, they, so we have here uh, like a telegraph wire, and we make a perturbation, and the signal will propagate along the wire. Weber, with his force law, and Kirchhoff, they did deduce the telegraphy equation that was published in 1857, seven years before Maxwell. As you can see, it, this is a wave equation with a damping. A damping when there is resistance in the wire. If there is no resistance in the wire, they did deduce the wave equation with Weber's force law, not with Maxwell's field equation. That was published in Annalen der Physik in 1857 by Kirchhoff and by Weber. In the textbooks, we learn that Maxwell introduced the displacement current into Ampere's force law. As a matter of fact, Ampere never wrote this equation, even without the displacement current. The first to obtain this equation was Maxwell himself in 18, published in 1862, if I'm not mistaken, other 58. Then Maxwell corrected himself and introduced the displacement curve. But I won't go into details here. What I want to call your attention is about when Maxwell did introduce this displacement curve here, introduced this constant C. Where did he take it from? He did take it from Weber's law 20 years earlier. Weber introduced this constant in physics. Weber was the first to measure this constant 10 years later, in 1856. And Weber and Kirchhoff were the first to deduce the wave equation seven years before Maxwell. Maxwell knew all of this before he introduced this term here. So he knew the constant from Weber, he took it from Weber's law, he knew the experimental value of this constant, which was first measured by Weber, and he knew that he, we could deduce the wave equation with this electrodynamics. So it, but in the textbooks, this does not appear. It comes everything from Maxwell's mind. He did only introduce this displacement current because then this equation would be compatible with the equation of conservation of energy, and then he found the wave equations, a la miracle, that the history is different. But this does not appear in the textbooks, but it was published in the Annalen der Physik. So, what I want to discuss here with you today is more about the distinction between Weber and Lorentz. They are very different from one another, completely different. There is no electric nor magnetic fields here. Only the charge, the distance, relative velocity, and relative acceleration. Lorentz, we have electric field and magnetic field. They are very different from one another. But I want to discuss one specific difference between them. In Lorentz force, if I ask the force except by two on one, it depends on uh, charge one and velocity one. There is no component here which depends on the acceleration of the test charge. With Weber, on the other hand, we have relative velocity. It doesn't matter if it is one or two, which is mo moving. And we have relative acceleration. It doesn't matter if it is one or two, which is accelerating. So it depends on both relative acceleration. So that's the main difference. If I take this Lorentz force law and apply the Lina, the Vichy potentials, and so on, and so on, and so on, I won't go into the details here, then we obtain this 
QE plus QV cross B, it will be these things here. Don't worry here about the details. This is about Weber. The main difference between Weber and Lorentz is that Weber depends on the acceleration of the test charge, A1. There is no such component in Lorentz. Lorentz depends on V1, which appears in Lorentz, QV cross B, but there is no third component here, Q1, A1 times another field. So there is no component which depends on the acceleration of the test charge, but with Weber there is. Okay? Can we distinguish them experimentally? I hope so. Not yet, but I hope so. I will now show you a specific experiment which we were discussing at the lunch uh, yesterday. Suppose I have a charged spherical shell. For instance, suppose that this room here is spherical, okay? Then I charge it with an electrostatic machine, with uh, uh, friction, doesn't matter, okay? Suppose this is spherical and I charge it. And here I have another charge. I can accelerate it with my hands. Okay, make, for instance, circular orbit. What will be the force exerted by the shell on the internal charge? The, the shell, if it is stationary and uh, uniformly charged, it generates no electric field inside and no magnetic field. So there will be no force exerted by the shell on the internal particle. Only the force exerted by my hand. But that is with Lorentz. With Weber, on the other hand, I won't go into the details of the calculation, but the force is no longer zero. So if I charge this sphere, sphere uniformly, and if I accelerate the, the internal charge with my hand, for instance, or with a magnet, then the uh, motion of the test charge will depend on the amount of charge which is spread in the surrounding shell. And this acceleration which appears here is the relative acceleration between the charge and the shell. Okay? So the force is no longer zero with Weber. With Lorentz it is zero. With Weber it is no longer zero. So, if we can make an experiment, yes, please. What do you mean by relative acceleration? Yes, A, here. No, no, geometrically, it's like, I mean, if you want a circle parallel to the shell, nothing will happen. No, then we have, uh, you have this uh, centripetal acceleration and so on. Sure. But what does it mean relative to the shell? Which direction? The, the, the shell, just, just like here, the shell, yeah. as it is th three-dimensional, it, it defines a, a direction. If I accelerate it here, there will be a force in this direction. If I accelerate it here, there will be a force in this direction. L later, on, later on, you give a look at the details, okay? Just then. And, uh, so, so if we, so that that's a possible experiment which people are beginning to perform nowadays. What is the kind of experiment they are performing? For instance, I can have a Larmor radius uh, electron describing a circular orbit due to a homogeneous magnetic field. Then I put everything inside the charged spherical shell, charge the shell and repeat the experiment to see if the radius of the circular orbit or the frequency, if it changes or not. If it doesn't change, Lorentz is correct. If it changes, Weber might be right. Okay? So this is the kind of experiment people are doing. Another kind of experiment which we could make is, suppose now that the sphere is spinning. Okay? In this case, in classical electrodynamics, I want to go into the details, but in this case, if we spin with a constant angular velocity, there will be a uniform magnetic field inside the sphere, just like inside an infinite solenoid. 
but inside the sphere it will also be uniform. Outside it will be a dipole field, but inside it will be uniform. So if you have a test charge moving, according to Lorentz, this will be the force. If we perform the same calculations with Weber, we obtain this result here. This is the previous result when the spinning shell was not spinning. When the spinning shell is spinning, we have a centrifugal electrical force and a Coriolis electrical force. These two cancels with this 12 and we come back to the classical result here. So the Coriolis component is the magnetic component of Lorentz. But Weber has two extra components, the previous one and the centrifugal electrical force. This would be a, an experiment for the future because we don't even need to spin because even with zero spin, this gives this and this gives zero. So, but, so there are differences between Weber and Lorentz, which you can go to the laboratory and test. It's fascinating. Uh, my next project is to publish an English translation of Weber's main works on electrodynamics. I'm looking for volunteers to help translate any of the articles. I'm very happy that here in the audience, Professor Urs Frauenfelder and Professor Joa Weber, they are already participating in this project. So, as there are other German guys here. If you know a, a German physicist who would like to work in this project, he is welcome, just let me know. Before I finish, we have some uh, minutes here. I want to uh, discuss with you another subject which to me has a, a, a very important meaning. So this is Weber's force, okay? I did begin to work with this force 30 years ago, just after my PhD. I was in, I finished my PhD in 87, here at this university, in physics. I, uh, my PhD was in plasma physics. So I did study electrodynamics, my field was uh, Maxwell's equations, propagation of waves, and all of that. Then I finished that in 87, then I did go to England and uh, spent one year, one year in Oxford working uh, at the laboratory there uh, on, uh, on uh, postdoc in plasma physics. Maxwell's equations, Lorentz force, and so on. But I always loved history of science, and ever since my undergraduate studies, I did love uh, history of science and so on. When I was doing my postdoc in England, I did borrow uh, a book by Whittaker, The History of the Theories of the Ether and Electricity, a historical book about the history of electrodynamics. And then there was just a, a chapter he did present Weber's force law. When I saw Weber's force law in this book, I said, this is what I was looking for for many years, because it depends only on distance, relative velocity, and relative acceleration. And then from that time, I did begin to work with Weber. It was in England in 88. The next year, I did publish my first paper on Mach's principle and so on, and I have been working for 30 years in this subject. Why did it call my attention at that moment? Suppose here, I have Newton's law of universal law of gravitation, m1, m2 over r squared. What is this r? We all know r is the distance between the two masses. But I can create another theory utilizing the same equation if I say that r is, for instance, the distance between the middle point between m1 and m2 and myself. Okay? 
this is crazy. <laughs> but you see, but, but I can flash the same equation. But it's not, it, it is no longer Newtonian theory. Also, I am utilizing the same equation. Okay? If you change the meaning, you change the theory. Okay? But what are you talking about this? When I was an undergraduate student here in Brazil, we did learn about Lorentz force law, QE plus QV cross B. I made my exercise, did make my exams, did passing my... But then one day, um, I did want to, to make an analogy. I did want to utilize the same law for gravitation. Because we have, uh, this is analogous to Newton's law of gravitation, F equals mg. So why not to have the same with gravitation? Mv cross a gravitational magnetic field. And I was undergraduate, just begun to play with that. So my idea was that when the sun, we have the sun and the Mercury describing an elliptical orbit, okay? But we know that there is the precession. So I want to deduce the precession. So my idea was that, oh, we know that the sun turns around its axis. We know that from the sun's spots. So why not, when the sun is spins, it could create a gravitational magnetic field, which goes up and goes down. And this would act on the Mercury planet. So I said, mg plus mv cross magnetic, uh, gravitational magnetic field. But to do the calculations to obtain, I, want, I need to know what is this velocity which I should apply. Velocity of Mercury relative to the Sun, velocity of Mercury relative to the spots of the Sun, relative to the fifth stars. So I was confused. And then I did go to my teachers here. What is this velocity in electrodynamics, in Lorentz force law? Is it velocity relative to the magnet? Velocity relative to the Earth? So, because I would apply the same thing in my idea. And so each teacher did give me a different answer. I was confused. So I did go to my textbooks. Uh, Halliday Hesnick. Uh, Griffiths, or Lorraine and Corson, or Jackson, or Feynman. Try it at home. You will see that they don't say it. They, every textbook on electrodynamics, they just say, if you have a charge T, Q, moving with velocity V in a magnetic field B, then the force is QV cross B. But they don't say V relative to what? So I ask you here a question. Here is the ground. Here it is my charge. I throw it in that way. Here it is a magnet, which will be interacting with the charge. I throw it in that way. And myself, I move in that way. Which velocity should I apply there? Velocity of the charge relative to the ground. Velocity of the charge relative to the magnet. Velocity of the charge relative to myself. The textbook should discuss that, because other, otherwise, how can we apply this? But they never discuss. Try it at home. You can look any textbook on electrodynamics. But as I did need the, this answer, I did go to the textbooks. But nowadays, what I will show to you is my historical research on this topic. We have different theories about the meaning of this velocity by different authors. I discovered that that was not, Lorentz was not the first to arrive at this equation. Maxwell himself has this equation in the treatise. And Maxwell says this velocity of the charge relative to the magnetic field. Then Thompson and Hebside, in two other papers, they say no, it is velocity of the charge relative to the medium with dielectric constant epsilon and magnetic permeability mu. Then came Lorentz and gave another answer. Lorentz said no, it is velocity of the charge relative to the ether. And 
But the ether we don't see. But Lorentz always accepted the ether, ether was at rest relative to the frame of the fixed stars. But you see, three different interpretations of V. Therefore, three different theories. But none of these is the present one. The present one, which we have in the textbooks, is a fourth one, which is this one by Einstein. He said, no, it is the velocity of the charge relative to the observer. I don't like any of them. When I found, as an undergraduate, that we, be, we utilize V as relative to the observer, to me, Andre, that never made sense. Because the charge is not attracted with me. If I have a charge here in that example, if the charge is moving with velocity Q relative to the ground, okay? and if I throw a magnet here, to me, the charge is interacting with the magnet. So I begun to play as an undergraduate. It should be. To me, that makes sense. Because the charge is interacting with the magnet, not with me. I can move with any velocity, it doesn't matter, because the charge is trapped with the magnet, not with me. So I begun to utilize this here, which is none of these. But this, this, this one didn't make sense to me. So I did begin to play with that. Okay? Until in 1988, I was in England in a history of textbook, I found Weber. I said, oh, that's much better because. Weber is distance between the charge, velocity between the two charges, acceleration between the charge. The observer is not here. So when I saw that, and moreover, it is central, action and reaction, I found my way. In physics, really, I was so happy at that moment. <laughs> and so for 30 years I have been working with that, because that appeals to my physical intuition. But before, I began with that, okay? That also makes sense to me. But then I, I found that even this is not completely relational and so on. This is much better. Yes, please. Yeah, I was going to ask, so what's wrong about that? We, we should follow some next words on that. Not so much, because here it is also relative to the magnet, not relative to the magnetic field, relative to the real magnet. I don't know what happens to this magnetic field. If I, for instance, suppose that these magnets move one meters per second to the right. I don't know if the magnetic field is moving with one meters per second. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how how did Maxwell would uh, how did Maxwell would know? How can you know? You don't see the magnetic field. If is the, the magnet is moving one meters per second, is the magnetic field moving one meter per second? I don't know. In the textbook they say that whenever you change anything, everything moves with light velocity, not with one meter per second. But maybe. But you see, here it is the magnet, not magnetic field, the real magnet. I don't talk about magnet, but maybe. Okay, maybe that, that's max. But anyhow. It doesn't matter. What I want to show, tell you, these are different, four different theories. Because each one of them has a different interpretation of V. Nowadays, I don't even, in my latest book, I did call, not in the textbook, we call it Lorentz force law. But we interpret it with Einstein. So it is no longer, to me, it's no longer Lorentz force law. It is Einstein's force law. In my latest book, I did call it Maxwell Lorentz for slow when I found that Maxwell had also this expression in his three T's. Nowadays, I don't even call it that way because each one has a different interpretation. So it's no longer the same. So it's a great confusion in the standard electrodynamics. Try it at home. Open all the textbook in which you did learn physics. 
and you ask the first time in which they present this Lorentz force, you see that they don't define that velocity. This is the reason why there is such a confusion. No one just discussed this topic. But it is essential. Otherwise, how can you make calculations if you don't know the meaning of this V? So this is just a parenthesis to show how did I get to Weber. That's it. So it's important today. That's enough. We can discuss now if you wish. beginning to do now, it's in the other slide, of this spherical shell. It's a crucial experiment. And uh, I hope people will get interested to perform this experiment. And it can be done with uh, low velocities. You don't go, need to go to velocities close to light. You can do it. Uh, it's a crucial distinction. <laughs> 